Welcome to this second week of the data analysis module. So last week we focused on visualizing data and I think that for this week probably because we introduced a lot of content last week we should continue for a little while on the same topic of visualizing data. So uh, last week we have seen this sort of data analysis pipeline where you go from a spreadsheet with the information of your data to a graph that you produce here on the right by using a script, an R script. Mm. So, and we have seen that all of this together is all together by R Studio, which is a sort of a big interface. Mm. If you want in R Studio you have these four different windows, these four different uh, tabs, where you have your script, the code that you write, you have the environment which contains all the variables in memory, it contains essentially all the information that was in the spreadsheet before, then you have uh, the console where you can actually run the program, you can copy and paste the program from the script to the console or as we have seen last time you can also hit the run button so that, that you run it directly and then you have this tab here where you it shows the output the plots that you produce for instance mm, all the all the all the files that when are displayed and there is a sort of a kitchen table analogy a kitchen analogy for our studio where you can imagine that all the uh, spreadsheet and so the variables that you load in memory are like your fridge and cupboards where you store objects, you store variables, you store things that need to be processed somehow and how they are processed there is a, a recite book which is your script that tells what should be done with those variables hmm? and then uh, the a tool which is like a oven or cooker where uh, things happen where the, the transformation between these variables to an output through the script happens mm. and the, uh, this final tab here on the bottom right is the output the, like the kitchen table where finally you you, you have the, uh, the pro final product of your analysis mm. so this uh, kitchen tab uh, kitchen analogy can help remember a little bit how our studio works. Now there are three main steps in this uh, data analysis pipeline. One is you need to produce a spreadsheet with the data. Then you need to have a script that analyzes the data that, that tells which operations should be performed on those data. And then you have this final output which is the, the graph. Mm. Today I would like to focus with you a little bit more on the spreadsheet itself. Mm. So this first step on the left, how do you prepare a good spreadsheet for, a, how do you organize data in a spreadsheet in such a way that they can easily be analyzed automatically. So here I have prepared a list of different rules on how to prepare this spreadsheet that you uh, should stick to. These same rules are also explained in the reading list for today, for this week, where you can find an article and other sources explaining why it is important to stick to these guidelines. Let's see them one by one. So the first suggestion is that you should be consistent. As much as possible, you need to be consistent on how you store your data. And here is an example of a bad data set where, for instance, I have used number as a one, but then for a second observation, I have uh, the ordinal number, second, and then I go back to uh, three, four, five, and so on. This one is written in words. They are very easy for, to understand for a human. If we read this, we, we can understand this is one, two, three, four, five, and, and so on. But you can imagine that for a computer, this can cause a lot of problems if you need to analyze this automatically with a script. 
another uh, example of an in inconsistency is here in the name of species where I use a small uh, letter or a capital letter uh, these two are different in this case I add the, the Latin name for the species while in other cases I don't this one is an abbreviation so uh, even if they all mean the same thing and it is easy for us to, to see that they all are the same for a computer it can be very difficult another example of inconsistency is here where I am using uh, these uh, spaces between here and here and the, the existence of a space will make this word, this sequence of characters, this string, different from the one above so even if they look very similar to us again this small difference of an added space here and here will uh, make a difference and then there are a few missing numbers but some that are uh, also missing and they were, uh, were uh, indicated with a code for instance not a number or an A or an A, an A N which are common uh, codes for missing numbers but here you have the three different possibilities together in the same table which, which makes it very difficult to to see. Some, some of these numbers are integers, some have a very big number of decimal places and all this variability will make the, the spreadsheet difficult to read not just for another person but for a computer script. One important thing is that you need to choose good names for things, for your uh, column names, variable names and there are a few characters that you should always avoid because they cause problems try to avoid using special characters for instance this hash uh, character here or the brackets or the um, uh, triangle here to indicate a square or even just a dot that uh, ab ab as an abbreviation and by the way this abbreviation for perimeter is too short so someone else reading the spreadsheet may not be able to understand that this is an abbreviation for perimeter or this abbreviation for species so uh, in, in terms of good names for the variables for the columns of your spreadsheet um, you should avoid special characters with the only exception I would say of the underscore hmm? try to um, avoid other abbreviations, try to avoid spaces mm. every time that you have a space, for instance in maximum temp here you can just replace it with an underscore mm. and so here are some examples of good variable names max temp c is quite useful because it tells me that this is the maximum temperature at which something happens for instance or a, uh, that was recorded and C tells me that it is measured in degrees and uh, Celsius degrees but it's also sufficient to explain have max temp usually because there isn't much confusion about the use of Celsius degrees or Kelvin degrees so you could have this as a good alternative in the in the middle while well, you should avoid this maximum temp with the C in brackets because of the use of spaces symbols such as this degree symbol and so on so that these are very difficult for a computer to understand and here is a, again a series of good examples and bad examples the slash is a, is a bad character to use because uh, in, in a computer the slash of, often indicates the separation between a file and a folder or between a folder and another folder and so, so all these characters that have a spe specific usage in computers uh, they have a meaning for the computer they should be avoided because they can lead to confusion and so uh, here there are two examples of good practice one is to use underscores to separate words the other is to use a capital letter to uh, separate words whatever you choose it's important that you are consistent and that you remember what kind of names you use remember that when, whenever you read these words from a computer software it is possible that moving from one computer to another a capital letter or a small letter will be interpreted as two completely different symbols so the computer may not recognize 
a word as the same if you use a capital or not don't use the capital letter A common problem that often arises is in with dates. First of all, this arises for those of you that use uh, Excel. You will see that Excel has a lot of tools to automatically detect dates and to change the format of dates so that they are consistent to each other, which in a sense it seems good, but because this is an automatic tool, sometimes uh, the, you, you are not writing a date at all, you are just writing maybe a, a, an abbreviation for something that is converted onto a date. Mm -hmm. And so, as a general rule, it, it is important that if you, if you write dates in the format year, then month, and then day, you can see that all of them will automatically sort in alphabetical order and temporal order in the same way. Well, if instead you put the month or day first, then they will no longer be sorted correctly when you sort them alphabetically, which is, can be the origin of many errors. Here there is an example of this spreadsheet in which the date has been written three times in different ways. Okay, Here is in Word. You see that there are days in October and November. Hmm? So if you put the number first, you would have uh, them sorted in the wrong way compared to if, if you put the year or the, the month first. So this one, you have the year first, then the month, then the number, and you can see that they are sorted alphabetically and it looks good. And these are the, the, the equivalent dates. You go from 30, 31st of, of October, and then you move to November. If instead you choose this type of format where you have the day first and you sort them alphabetically, you get first the 1st November as in the first row, and then you jump to the 10th of November, then to the 11th of November, then to the 2nd of November. So it, it becomes completely chaotic. And as soon as you try to read this in a computer program, you may experience problems. So this is one important thing to remember. Whenever you write a date, just write the year first, then the month, then the day. And uh, a, a possible suggestion is also to use three different columns of your uh, spreadsheet, but this is more uh, up to you. You can you can kind of them together in the same column, separated by uh, lines, or you can have them one column for the year, one for the month, and one for the day, whatever you find more convenient. I personally keep them together usually. Empty cells. Mm. Sometimes it happens that you, you collect observations, but you may miss some values for, for any reason. It could be because uh, of an experimental error, or maybe you had to stop the experiment early. Something happened. Mm. Or, or maybe just the, the measure didn't work. So, something went wrong. When you have a missing value, you want to avoid leaving an empty space in the spreadsheet because an empty space can have different meaning. You, you don't know what will come to be in that empty space. Will it be a zero or will it be a, a no data or not a number? So there are different uh, ways of doing. Some people write not a, not a number, not available, uh, but because of the use of the slash, you should avoid this. You should avoid putting a random big number because maybe when you give the data to someone else, they will not know, or they will forget that this is a missing data, the code that you choose for missing data, and maybe that this will stay in the calculations and give some completely random results. And you should avoid leaving it blank or putting some symbol like this. The, the best option is to use uh, a specific code which could be NA, for instance, for our users. So you always consistently use the same uh, code. Another important thing to remember is that you should avoid putting more than one thing in one cell. Mm. This is an example of bad practice again. Uh, here I have the name of the species, the, the, the common name and the Latin name of the species. And then I have the area with the units. Of course, we want to know the units 
that will be uh, were used. But if I have this in a single column, it will be very difficult for any software to, to read this as both the number and the units. It's easier for the software to have just one piece of information in each cell to know if that piece of information is a number or is a word or a label or something else. So in this case, for instance, if you want to put the units for area somewhere else, there are two main options. You could have an extra column with the units, centimeter squared, or you could add uh, to the name of the um, of the column, to the, the label of the column, the units. So it could be area underscore CM2, hmm? something, something like this. So you have the units here, or you have the units in a different column. And in this case, for the species, you could split them. For instance, have a column for the common name and a con column for the Latin name of the species. So if I look at this table, as a human, I find it really nice. You see, there is this uh, uh, header for each uh, tree species, which is highlighted in yellow with all the columns merged together. And the information below, it's really nice to see and uh, I like it. But the problem is that when you try to uh, make this understand to a computer, you need to think that the, for the computer, what is really important is the position of the each row, the coordinates of each row and each, sorry, each, each row and each column in your data set. And in this case, you can see that the same row has information here about two different species. Hmm? And the, the same column also has information about two different species. And there is an additional complexity which is introduced by the fact that you are merging together these four cells. So if, if the uh, computer has to know the coordinates, say, of this uh, label here, it won't be able easily to know if this is at position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, say, for instance, or if it is at position 1, 2, 3, hmm? because of the, the cells merged together. So because of this way of wo working of computer programs where they really have an easy system of coordinates uh, in uh, rows and columns, it is much, much better if you can have a single rectangle with your data all organized in the same way, in a consistent way such that each column is maybe a variable and each row is an observation when you collect data, you often have some nodes that are associated with the data. For instance, uh, one observation went wrong, one observation was maybe biased by something happening, and so on. And you want to keep a track of those nodes. But as I said before, you don't want to, uh, to change the, the organization of the main spreadsheet that you use for analysis. So a way of uh, addressing this issue is by creating an additional column which you call an ID number, for instance, so that each observation has a unique ID number. And then you can have a, a separate spreadsheet, a separate file, where you include all the nodes about those observations. Mm. For instance, in this uh, uh, ex additional spreadsheet, you can say uh, more information about the treatment that is not part of the analysis, but is something that you, can, you want to monitor some notes, uh, problems that uh, arise, this, why the data could be incomplete, but you still, you know, uh, sometimes the fact that some data point is not complete is not necessarily a reason to removing it from the analysis because maybe it was almost uh, complete or, or, for, or you think it is valuable anyway. And so you, you can keep them by having separate file where you add your notes for each observation. Avoid doing calculations graphs in the raw data file. I, I know that you, you probably, if, if you are an Excel user, 
we often do uh, simple calculations in the, the file. We, we can use uh, R, uh, sorry, Excel to, to do calculations on each element of the column. We can make plots. And it is convenient, especially if you have a very small data set, you can, um, uh, you can do very quickly some analysis. It's, it's not as having a full R script that we have experienced last week can can be a little bit scary when you start it's a, it's it's a little bit of work before you can actually see the graph while with excel maybe you are, you are able to plot the data immediately now the problem is that if you if you do this and and do the calculations in r when you save to another program sorry when you do the calculation in excel when you save to another program or you export, you send to someone else, or maybe in a few years, Excel will release a different version of the, the software. The risk is that you, all the, your calculations are hidden in the file and, and you lose them. And even more uh, dangerous is the fact that maybe at some point you change one row of your file, you move it somewhere else, you, ch you change something and everything else will update but you don't have that much control on what is happening. So for this, it is much better if you can have a, a data file, a raw, a raw file, a spreadsheet with just data, and all the calculations go in the, in the R script, in the, the, the program that analyzes the data, which is also good because you can then save the script, and even years after, you will have the full set of instructions that were followed to go from the spreadsheet to the graph. So, so all the analysis is written there. You keep track of the analysis. Now, another thing that you might be, might be tempted doing is using colors in the spreadsheet to encode information. I make an example. For, for this uh, old example of, uh, leaf, of leaves of trees, which from different species, Maybe you recorded the color of the leaf hmm? and you would say, oh, it is convenient if I can have the color also highlighted in the same color uh, as it was. Some leaves were green, some were yellow, and it is much easier for our eyes to, to see which of our leaves were yellow if we actually put a yellow cell in the spreadsheet. So again, it, this is something that for, for us, a human observer w looking at the data set, it's good to have colors, but when you save these colors, you don't know what will be saved. You don't know if they will open in the same way in a different piece of software. And what is most important, if you try to read this information, the color of the cell into R, the, the software will not be able to read anything. So it gives you unpredictable results and uh, it can be the source of major errors in your analysis. A few other important uh, things to remember. Uh, one is to make backups of your work. Nowadays, it, this is less of a concern because most of what we do is uh, backup almost automatically, depending if you work on a, a Google Drive or uh, if you have some settings uh, like Dropbox or, uh, or other tools that do these backups automatically for you. But uh, still uh, problems can happen i i know for instance of a phd student a few years ago that was uh, uh, collecting data for uh, his thesis and in the second year it was uh, all the data were stored in i think even two different computers in the university but at some point one summer there was uh, the, those two computers were stolen and uh, so the student lost uh, almost two years of data uh, using data validation. So, so uh, I don't insist too much on this, but it, uh, you can check that the data that are in each column are what you expect them to, to be. So if you expect in a particular column of your spreadsheet to, to be a date or uh, an integer number or something uh, something else, you can check that the number that is actually there is uh, in the right format, is actually a date, is actually an integer number and so on. So some of these calcul validations, calculations can be done automatically as well. And then uh, important, save data as plain text. Uh, 
so the, one of the reasons is because uh, if you save ex with uh, Excel or another format, you don't know uh, what happens to those data. Maybe f when you move from one version of the software to another. And uh, for those of you who have been reading the news, just last week we had this huge problem of uh, a lot of data about uh, COVID-19 infections that were lost because of the problem of how different versions of Excel uh, store data and how, how many data they can store. I, I, I don't know exactly the detail of the problem that happened, but this is again, when you move from one version to another of a software, you, you risk losing data while the CSV file, comma separated value file, is a text file. It can be opened with any software and uh, it is uh, so anyone anywhere can see the information that is in that file. Uh, the next step I would like to uh, talk, but only very briefly, is the script. Okay, to, just to uh, to go back to this again and again so that uh, we explain and learn a few more things mm? even if knowing that it is going to, to be difficult to to become really proficient in, in this mm? in the script you have two main things one are objects so the variables object they are called objects they are variables where they where you store data for instance we created data in the first practical uh, a variable called h and which is an object called h which uh, stores the number 170 another the variable called w that stores the number 80 and then we read the file name which created a new variable called file name which stored the path to the file name to a particular file on your computer mm -hmm. and then we can create other types of variables uh, D where it was the variable where, where we read the whole data set that was contained in the file and then we can create a vector so uh, variable B that comprises all the numbers 2, 3, 5, 8 and 13 or a variable that contains a word like in this case the variable Q will contain the word cat if, if we run this line of code. So there are these objects and then there are functions. The functions perform a set of instructions on objects. Uh, for example, the function rNorm creates a number of random, uh, a certain number, in this case 1000, uh, random numbers distributed with a normal distribution. Mm -hmm. So if I run this command, I create a new variable called x which contains 1000 num random numbers and then I can run other functions on x for instance I can run the function mean which will calculate the mean of the object that I put here so in this case the mean of all the values contained in x or median is another function that calculates the median of all the elements in x or ST, which calculates the standard deviation of all the elements in X. Sort, which will just return another vector with 1000 elements, where all the numbers are sorted in an ascending order or descending order. And then the quantile function, which is a function that calculates a particular quantile of a vector of a distribution. So, so if I ask the quantile of x and I say that I want the uh, 0 0.25, I'm uh, getting the quantiles that corresponds to the 25% of the data in x. All the objects have a class which determines what kind of data they contain. For instance, I made some examples before where q was storing the word cat so this is this is q is a variable that has of the class character it contains characters the, the characters that compose the word cat while h contains the number 170 so if i ask for what class h is it is a numeric variable it contains a number the number 170 and the the type of class that we will use most with uh, with R because we, we don't do much else than plotting data in, in our work is the data frame. So uh, essentially, uh, when when we created the data frame D, 
we store the entire information in our spreadsheet in a single big variable, which is called a data frame. Mm. So these are different types of variables. You don't need to, to know too much about these variables and, and, until in, maybe in some very special circumstances. But you, you can see that these are different variables and they can store different types of data. And depending on the type of data, that they store, of course, you can do different operations on them because uh, you can sum numbers, but probably you cannot sum characters, for instance. So it, uh, some function will work on this type of variables that are numeric. Some functions will work on variables that are uh, characters, for instance. An argument of a to a function is an object, usually, that needs to be analyzed by the function. Mm? So for instance, the function mean will calculate the mean of an object. And if I give x as the object, it will calculate the mean of x. In this case, it is very close to zero because it is a, a normal distribution, so it is uh, it's centered to zero. If I calculate the standard deviation, hmm, as d is a function that calculates the standard deviation of an object, and for instance, I can use the object x. But I, I could put any object and calculate the, the standard deviation for that particular object. And so on. These are examples of some common statistical functions to calculate the mean, the median, the standard deviation of a, a set of numbers. And uh, so by using these scripts, we produce a graph. Hmm? When we produce a graph, be, even before we decide what kind of script we use, what type of graph we produce, we need to think about what we want to plot. And I think what, there are two things to focus on. One is what type of variables we uh, are plotting. Mm -hmm. So one variable will be the explanatory variable, so it could be or independent variable. So it's, it's the variable that you produce with your experiment. Usually, of course, it, uh, so sometimes you, you plot the correlation or the, the relation between variables that are all observed. Mm? But usually, if, if you have the choice to plot one variable on the x-axis, you will plot on the x-axis the variable that is independent, the one that you control. For instance, it could be the amount of fertilizer that you add, it could be the time that the uh, has passed, and uh, it could be the, I don't know, so the intensity of a treatment. While the dependent variable is the outcome, or at least what you consider to be the outcome uh, of the independent variable, so how much the plant grows as a response to the fertilizer, or how much a population changes in size as a function of time. Hmm? So this is the first point that you need to consider, what type of variables, what is dependent and what is independent variable. And the other thing that you need to consider is if your data are continuous or categorical. Sometimes uh, it is not completely clear, you, you could classify data as uh, categorical or continuous, but most of the time there is a clear distinction. For instance, age will be continuous because uh, there is a continuous range of ages uh, that you can measure. Rainfall in a particular region is also continuous. You, you can go from zero to a certain number of millimeters of rain per day or per year and so on. Uh, weight is a continuous variable that you can measure in very small increments. Or the number of individuals in a group is also a continuous variable that you can increase one by one uh, to some extent. While there are uh, categorical variables which can only have uh, one, two, or a few categories, such as uh, sex, location, uh, if you have, for instance, if you compare between two locations, two, two, two well-defined places in, in space, or two different species, uh, and, and so on. So these are categorical. And depending if you have a continuous or a categorical variable, the type of plots that you can do are different. Mm -hmm. So for instance, with categorical variables, you can have uh, bar graphs, box plots, 
uh, violin plots, these kind of plots, while co with continuous variables you can have a scattered plot, a line graph, and these other type of uh, histogram if, if necessary, these other type of, uh, of plots.